All right. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome to another one of our uh, James Dalton webinars. Shadow Trader is very proud to be hosting Jim once again. Uh, today, Jim is going to be talking about trading gaps and trend days, which is uh, exciting and timely because we certainly had a lot of large gaps and we've had a few trend days and today was no exception. So without any further ado, I present to you, Mr. James Dalton. Peter, thank you. And uh, as you know, um, we had a difficult time deciding what day to have this because we wanted to know when the when we were going to have a trend day. So we got it right. Anyhow, um, it's there's been some unusual days lately. Today was uh, was a trend day, which uh, and a gap. So we've got something to talk about. But it's going to start with it. First of all, just to make clear that everybody knows what I mean when I'm talking about a gaps. Gaps are only measured from the low of the previous day on a downward gap and from the high of the previous day on an upward gap. I'm only looking when the gap tells me that I'm totally out of range relative to the previous day. I, I have It's nothing to do with where the settle was last night. I'm only measuring a gap when we're totally out of range relative to the previous day. Um, and when when I do it this way, gaps tell us that a market is out of balance. It tells us that something has changed. When you open out of range with a gap, you either continue in the direction of the gap, which would signify change, or you fill the gap and start to move with the direction of the fill. And in that case, it's usually a pretty big opportunity because the market tried to go out of balance. It failed. And when that happens, the destination trade, or at least the potential, becomes the opposite end of the range. When we go to look at the today's market, you'll see that today we opened gapped lower. So we opened totally out of yesterday's range. We came back into yesterday's range, which then made theoretically – uh, yesterday's high, uh, the destination trade on the upside. It made it by a little bit more today. We have some basic rules. Go with all gaps that aren't filled fairly quickly. And I don't have an exact uh, definition of what fairly quickly is. But it's just you'll see a gap. The best opportunities, let's say the market gaps higher. And the best uh, buying opportunity would be when the market attempts to fill the gap, both tempo and volume slow down on the attempt to fill the gap. That is usually your best buying opportunity of the day. The other opportunity is like today, you gap lower. When it fills the gap quickly, that's another situation where you want to go with the gap. Early trend days are usually announced via high confidence. Trend days can be associated with gaps, and that's why I bunched the two together. If you gapped lower, for example, the market doesn't fill that gap, then you may get a trend day on the downside. Of course, you don't have to, but that's a situation that you would be looking for the potential for a trend day. If you, um, trend days are usually uh, announced via high confidence. So you gap, if you have a, the larger the gap, the larger the gap, the lower the odds that that gap is going to be filled. The smaller the gap, the greater the odds that the gap will be filled. The larger the gap kind of reduces the odds for a trend day a little bit because the market's moved so far already. But like you say, gaps are important. They announce change or potential change. And Trading is about change, so we certainly want to pay a lot of attention. Trend, when we have a trend day, it's usually announced via high confidence. 
And you'll see when we went in today, we had high confidence from the beginning. Once you have a trend day, it becomes very important to know how to monitor that trend day for continuation. The absolute biggest single mistake that traders make, and they make it time and time again, is they go against the trend day. They can't resist fading the trend day. Absolutely, the single biggest error traders ever make is fading trend days. Go with the trend day. If the trend day is up, for example, if you want to trade, what you do is you take profits on rallies, you buy back on the breaks. You do not short the rallies with the idea of buying back on the break. You may get away with it a couple of times, but that is not, if the trend day is up, for example, you want to take profits on rallies if you get out at all. Then if the market settles back, you want to buy it again. You want to be in tune with the trend day. Now, monitoring the trend day for continuation. If it's a trend day up, for example, what you will normally see is one time framing. One time framing means, and I do everything with 30-minute bars, one time framing means that the second bar, second 30-minute bar, if it's going higher, that the second 30-minute bar does not take out the low of the first 30-minute bar. The third minute, 30-minute bar does not take out the low of the second 30-minute bar. Now, we make it that it has to do it by two ticks. If it's not two ticks, it hasn't taken it out. So one time framing is one of your great monitors for a trend day. One of the huge traps that traders fall into, you will normally find that one time during a trend day, the market will stop one time framing. So, for example, if the if the trend is to the upside, like today's was, you'll usually find that one time the market stops one time framing. That allows the short-term inventory to come back into balance, and then they come back and usually make another run on the trend day. And that's exactly what happened today. Now, the pullback when it stopped one time framing – was a little bit more severe than usually. Of course, we are dealing with markets with a lot more uh, volatility than we're accustomed to in the last few years. But it stopped one time framing one time. When the market came back, it took out the original high. And of course, today was an unusual day. You had a big extension to the upside. But it did fit. It did fit the definition of a trend day and how you monitor one of the other things you do on a trend day, you monitor volume. Now, today was unusual because we did not have we did not have higher volume today. We were a fraction higher than yesterday, but it was very light volume. So that makes me cautious going forward that today's trend day will hold or not see a lot of it taken back in the next couple of days. So the trend day. You go with the trend day. The worst thing you can ever do, and it's the biggest mistake traders make, and they usually can't resist it, is fading a trend day. You don't want to fade a trend day. You want to trade with the direction of that trend day for the entire day. Trend days can also evolve from rotational trading days. So in traders, actually, traders... Markets can go from trend to balance, or they can go from balance to trend. It's not very often that you see a trend day turn into a balancing day later in the session, but it certainly happens. Markets are always looking for a level where two-sided trade can take place. Today's market never found that level. But sometimes the markets start off from a, a position of balance. And then from that balance, 
they go into trend days. More often than not, when it goes from a, a balancing day to a trend day, you'll have what we call a double distribution day. So the first distribution or where the market was trading in a rotational manner will be separated from the next distribution by single prints. That's your double distribution trend day. The least reliable trend day is the double distribution trend day. The most reliable trend day is a trend day that starts on high confidence from the opening from the opening bell. Signs that a late trend may develop when you're having a you know a rotational day. The migrating POC, the POC or point of control, or what I also call the fairest price at which business is being conducted. And I think that is by far the best term to use. It's the fairest price at which business is being conducted. It will help you have a better understanding of what is going on in the market. So you'll see the POC or the fairest price migrating in the direction that the trend develops in later in the session. The Profile structure will often be elongating. And there'll be more rotational volume in the direction of the developing trend. So if the trend is developing to the downside, for example, you'll have less volume on rallies and you'll have more volume on breaks. Those are usually just some of the indications that a balancing day can turn into a trend day. Other things you look for is a very often, if you have a normal, I'm, so, I'm sorry, a narrow base in the morning, the narrower the base, it's like a lamp, the easier it is to knock over, the more likely that you're going to get a trend day coming out of that later in the session. They're just some of the clues that you look for. In these, uh, in these days. Again, monitoring trend days for continuation, extremely important. You're constantly observing level, levels of confidence. Sometimes you'll see that the confidence is too high. When you see a situation that the confidence is too high, in other words, it's just too strung out, too elongated, you will either get a late reversal of that day, but more likely you're going to get the reversal the following session. What you find so often is once a, a you get a tone to the day, that market has more of a tendency to maintain that tone throughout the session. Even if the structure looks poor uh, and volume is poor, but once it gets that tone, it, it tends to hold that throughout the session. If you're going to get a break in the trend day, it usually happens late or it happens the following day. And then another question becomes, there's, here's, the, here's a more difficult question. How do you know what time frame or time frames are leading the trend? And this is something that we talk about in our classes constantly. If you see markets that are constantly going to very visual, well-identified reference levels, that more than likely are they being driven by shorter time frames? When you see markets ignoring those visual reference points, and like they don't even exist, that is generally an indication that you have some longer term money or longer term time frames in the market. As you probably understand, they if you've got longer term money in the market, they don't even know what we're talking about. If we said, you know, half back is a daytime frame reference, um, stop one time framing, longer term money, 
they have no idea what those are. They look at you like you're crazy if you start talking to them about those things. But when you see the market reacting around, you know, references that you see every day, you know, the opening, half back, um, those kind of things, you know that that is more than likely short-term money. Short-term money has more of a chance of turning on you later in the session. You want to monitor activity at significant reference levels. Does it stall there or does it go right through? You know, the more it stalls there, um, the lesser chances that you have significant money. The more it stalls there, um, the less it stalls there, the more chance you go that you've got significant money in the market. The more it stalls, stalls there, the greater the odds that you have mostly short-term trading money. I say volume is always significant, although it didn't uh, it didn't help me today at all. All right, let's um, let's go and let's put this in to reality. And this is a really unusual day, Peter. You did a great job of picking this day for us. We start off this morning, and let's mark. Um, these things, days are so spread out, they're hard to see. The bottom side at 2572.50 is the opening this morning. You will see that the opening was below yesterday's low. So this is a this is a gap lower this morning. Now I'm going to take a second and I'm going to put the overnight activity um, in place. Take just a second for this to catch up. Okay, what you see the overnight high is right here and you see the market trade lower all night long Trades a lot of volume near the lower uh, end. And we gap lower tonight with overnight inventory being 100% long. I sorry, 100% short. Let me show you how we measure overnight inventory. Okay. Last night's, uh, I'm sorry, right, the, the red line. Peter, can you see the red line? Uh, which red? Yes, I see the red line. Okay. 2607.25? Oh, the higher one, yes. Right I see at the, the top. That is last night's settle. We measure overnight inventory from the previous day's settle down to the low. So 100% of all overnight trade took place below yesterday's settle. That means that 100% of the overnight inventory is short. We have found, and this isn't a scientific, it's, it's a rougher calculation, but we have found that about 65% of the time, when overnight inventory is short, and it doesn't have to be 100% short, but about 65% of the time, when overnight inventory is short, the odds are that we will almost immediately have a short covering rally. The same is true if overnight or if overnight inventory is short or if overnight inventory is long. Another way to put it is the odds are about 65% that we will have a counter auction or a reversal of overnight trade. Some of the exceptions, if you have a combination of say 100% short overnight inventory, for example, and a large gap opening, then the odds are less that you're going to get a counter auction to overnight inventory, or at least a <coughs> counter auction that is terribly significant. 
The reason for that, usually when you have a large gap opening, that very often means that there was some more serious money involved in the big gap. And those big gaps have less odds of being filled. The smaller gaps are far more often, like this morning, an indication that it was nervous, emotional money that created the short overnight inventory. When you have the situation when it looks like the overnight inventory is 100% short and it looks like it was more emotional uh, selling, then the odds are pretty good that you're going to have a short covering rally. So as you see this morning, we did gap lower. Overnight inventory was 100% short. And we got an immediate, take the A period. There's A period. So we got an immediate short covering rally out of the A period. Taking back a good portion, we took back over half of the overnight range just in the A period. Now, anytime, as I said, anytime a gap is filled, the destination trade is the opposite end of the range. So the destination trade today was yesterday's high at 2618.75. And you can see that the market made that. But let's talk about some of the difficulties in trading uh, those days. When the market has been off that much, you get the rally. You tend to have traders selling into the early rallies. And that can, that can add a great deal of confusion uh, to your mind, mentally and emotionally. And I would like to say that I'm, you know, free of that with all my experience. But uh, this morning was a wonderful example. I um, I came in in the morning, long 2610 calls that I bought for 12. I was very proud of myself when I sold them for 17, you know, on one of these early rallies, and then let the market set back. And, of course, later in the session, um, as you know, they were trading, uh, they were trading for astronomical amounts. So it's very easy. Hold on one second, please. <clears throat> it is very easy to get yourself out of whack emotionally. Notice now I said one time framing a period B period did not take out the a period low C period did not take out the B period low. D period did not take out the C period low. E period did not take out the D period low. F period did not take out the E period low. But notice F period, um, F period goes up and takes out, I'm sorry, F period, and then finally G period go up and take out yesterday's high. This market was really struggling up here, and it finally got it. And once they got it, the selling came in. Now, for our clients, there is a chat function, and the chat function works that I can type into my computer. It can, uh, the, My chat comments appear on their computer screen. If they have, uh, we have a private Twitter account, so if they have signed into our private Twitter account, a bell rings so they know they've got a chat message. So in this case, the market did stop, did stop one time framing in H period. At that period of time, the post that I put out was caution on a trend day. Very often, the trend will stop one time framing once. That allows short-term inventory to come back into balance. And following that rebalance of inventory, the market then comes back up and goes for the high again. Well, that was a little slippery today because this was a pretty good break. An H period um, did stop one time framing. So it was, you know, it goes through the uh, the rule. H period 
only stop one time framing once for the day, and then I, J, K, and L, and the rest of the day, the market one time framed higher. Now, I'd like to be talking to you and pounding my chest and tell you, you know, that I was long all afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do that. All the information was there. Um, sometimes it just gets hard to believe uh, how far these markets are, are going to go. But it followed today's filling the gap and the, and the, uh, the trend, upward trend, followed all of the rules. Also, the worst thing you can do on a trend day is fade the gap. That also was very evident today. The worst thing you could have done today was fade the gap. All the rules are there. I wish I could say, you know, I wish I would say I was long all afternoon. Uh, I was long this morning, you know, um, and then I had a little bit of trouble getting back on the, the long simply because the volume wasn't there. Uh, so I had a little trouble, but from everything I said, it followed all the rules we have talked about. So just as a fast review, before we open up for questions, first are the gap trading rules. Gaps are extremely important because a gap tells you that something has changed or it tells you there was an attempt to change something and that attempt failed. So if the gap is downward and it stays and it doesn't fill that downward gap, then you've got information that something has changed in the market and the direction is now down. If like today, the market gapped lower, the market doesn't hold that gap, there was an attempt to go out of balance on the short side, that attempt to go out of balance failed, the destination trade now becomes the opposite end of the range. And that is exactly what happened today. Like I said, sometimes it can be very confusing in the middle because the markets <clears throat> slow down um, and they have a, tender, a tremendous way of misleading you. But gaps are, gaps are important. The bigger the gap, the greater the opportunity, the greater the odds that that gap will not be filled. The smaller the gap, the greater the odds it will be filled. I remember probably the worst piece of information ever given to me. It was my first day or week as a trader on the Chicago Board of Trade. One of the uh, older, more seasoned gentlemen who always kind of, you know, take the younger guys um, around their arm, told me, son, you know, we fade gaps around here. And, you know, we make our money fading markets. Well, you know, when you're brand new and an old timer tells you this, by golly, you think you got to fade the gaps. And I find that was probably the worst piece of information anybody ever gave me. But I also, to this day, I will, I will have people that have become clients of ours talk about a lot of the past trading that they have had. And a lot of it was automatically telling people uh, to fill the gaps, that was to fade the gaps. That was just a primary piece of their education. And I just shake my head and I said, well, you know, 40 some years ago, that's the worst piece of information that was given to me. What you really want to do, you want every trade, every situation to stand on its own. You want to be able to look at the context, understand the context. For example, this morning we came in, 100% overnight inventory is short. We know that there's a very high percentage that you are going to get a counter auction to that overnight inventory. This morning, the gap was a small gap. The gap was filled immediately, and the market rallied almost back to half back immediately. The worst thing you could have done is fade the gap. Let the context speak for itself. The context this morning was... Overnight inventory was very short, and it more than likely was an emotional type of shorty because when you see the markets 
And let me just show last night's inventory for a second. I mean, it's one of the first things I look at when I get get up this morning. <laughs> when I see, you know, the um, I see the market in you know relatively narrow range until about the time they open in Europe, and you see, you know, these periods go straight on down. Larger when you see a market go straight down like this, larger money does not murder a market. The people that murder a market are shorter-term emotional traders. They're so afraid they're going to miss something. But when I see a market thin like that going straight down, that is generally emotional trading. That uh, generally, that kind, excuse me, that kind of trader the trading sees a reversal. So that was my context coming in this morning. All right, now you take uh, today's market, and I am very suspect of today's rally. Is it a huge rally? Yes, it is. The volume wasn't there, and the market's extremely elongated. Again, indicating to me that more than likely, we were seeing a tremendous amount of emotional buying today. Not larger, not larger fund money. Larger fund money, larger institutional managers do not butcher a market like this. Then I go up and I look and say, okay, well, let's... Um, Let's see if there's any exceptions to that. And let me see. Maybe I can't get to it from here. But if I go up and I look at volume from today, you'll see that volume was very light on a tiny range day. It was extremely light for the range covered today. That is an indication to me that I was looking at a lot of emotional buying, uh, a lot of non-thinking buying. Low volume, that kind of buying has a pretty good chance of seeing at least part of it reversed in the next day or two. Peter, uh, unless there are, uh, you know, I, at least I don't have anything else. I guess, I guess I should before we take questions. Um, I should talk about, uh, you know, what you and I are involved in here, and that is that uh, the we are currently. In, involved in offering our second uh, intensive for the year. Uh, session one uh, just completed. Session two uh, begins on April 18th, and it runs through May 18th. These sessions have been very, very well received. As a matter of fact, the last session was the best uh, reviews that we've ever had. And I think part of that is, um, I've made them more aggressive. We're now covering, we cover two types of trades. We cover day trades that are, you know, maybe one or two day trades you're looking for a day. But we also are now pointing out what I call fast trades or scalping trades. Totally different mindset. We, des we describe the, the difference in personality and the difference in, you know, capabilities for those doing the fast trades or the scalp trades versus those looking for one or two uh, trades uh, throughout the session. Totally different time frames. And we address what are you looking for if you are looking for uh, swing trades of a little longer uh, duration. Uh, you can see the, uh, the schedule on our website of the details of the entire, uh, you know, day. Uh, but I think there's some 60 hours or so in uh, of live webinars going out through these sessions. We start each day with a webinar um, that's live for an hour and a half, two hours. Then I chat throughout the uh, the session. Uh, access to recorded webinars. All our webinars are recorded, so if you miss one, yeah, you can uh, go back to it. Um, there's two daily reports, um, and we're starting right now. Uh, even though it doesn't start till April 18th. As soon as you sign up, you get the evening report and the morning report. Uh, I explained earlier the commentary where I chat throughout the session. And if you have a Twitter account, it'll ring the bell for you that it's there's one out there. Questions and answers, and we're always looking for market logic and, and uh, trade identification. What, what else we have had that is probably the most highly regarded thing we've ever done. It's a daily synopsis video recap. 
They're short 20 minute or less videos. They're run at high speed, but they, they mark all the comments I made or most of the comments I made during the day time session. Um, and they're spaced next to the time that they were made. Your friend, as you watch these meeting, these synopsis are really the space bar. So you can go back and replay these. Like I say, they're 12 to 20 minutes, but you can stop any place along the line, hit the pause bar, and you can take a look at what we were talking about and what happened in that period of the of the market. And you see the again, the identification of the fast and slow trades throughout the session. And what we're really trying to do is give you a chance to learn my thought process and what's really going on in my head throughout the the session. The the goal is to accelerate a trader's learning curve. Okay. Um, These, like I said, the second session is um, April 18th to May 18th. Um, As uh, price is 12.95, discounted price valid through 420. And there's the code uh, in front of you. You can slides. Peter's got that slide. Um, So, the you can contact us or you can phone us, but Peter's got that information. So, Peter, before I take questions, um, do you have anything to add? Um, only that um, I always, for a long time now, Jim, I've added a number four to your gap rules which you touched upon, but you don't have it as an official rule, but but I've made it one of my own. And that is simply that when the gap is very large, it is really easier said than done to trade it early. And part of the reason is something that you touched upon is the market has already traveled quite a way. And so it's trying to either fade or, or come in and you know retrace some of that. And those large gaps, a lot of times the market this was an anomaly kind of to me where the market opened and it just took off and started kind of moving slowly in one direction. But usually what happens is when the gap is larger than 10 points, the market will take time to digest because what it's doing is digesting everything that's already happened in the overnight. Um, so I would just add that, you know, that, that's been a gap rule that's helped me a lot where, you know, you often uh, teach that uh, you have to figure out is the trade early or is the trade later? And, I find that on those days when there's a very large gap, it's clearer to me just slightly later. Maybe that's 10 a.m., maybe that's 10.30, whatever, but, you know. Yeah, that's a great point. And and, in a way, I did cover it. I said, you know, on those days, the best, let's say it's a large gap up. The best buying opportunity usually takes place when the market starts to trade off. And as it is trading off, volume and tempo slow. And as that volume and tempo are slowing, that's the point that you normally want to enter uh, the trade with the gap. Uh, That may happen early. It may happen, you know, in the first hour or so, but you want to see the market try and correct. You see the tempo slow, the volume gets lighter, and that is usually where you want to enter the market. Incidentally, Peter... Um, these codes are for Peter. Peter is the, uh, the only person we have ever invited to offer our product. And the reason for that is we don't want to be in the position where somebody's overselling what we do or what they're going to get. Uh, Peter has spent a lot of time with us and we have such total belief in Peter's integrity that it's the, he's the only person that's ever been, uh, invited to sell our products. Peter, you got anything else before we go to the questions and answers? Yeah, Jim, from uh, from personal. So today was an interesting day for me because I was uh, handling our squawk box for Brad, who was away for a couple of days. And the reason I mention that is because I want you to understand that in our squawk box, we trade pretty actively and we also sort of take it on upon ourselves as a responsibility to call the market tick by tick. So it's a very, very dynamic, very, you know, everybody's just on top of it. You know, we're just there in it. And, you know, breadth is this and internals are that and profiles doing this. And, okay, we're crossing above the overnight high and, and et cetera, et cetera. 
I will be the first one to admit that I did not believe this move early on because I was a couple of things happened. First of all, we didn't really gap, as you know. We we opened up only a point below the range. Most of the overnight activity that was the big gap happened before the market opened. So the market did open on a 100% net short overnight inventory. However, it had already bounced a huge amount by the time the bell rang. You would agree, right? We were already well off those lows. So I felt that the early action was a push-pull between the fact that there were still a lot of people short. We opened about you know a couple of ticks below the low. We went into the range. And early on in the session, we are now trading not only within yesterday's range, but we are trading within value because the value area was relatively far down yesterday on 4.3, went all the way to 25.77.50, and we started trading there. So one of the reasons that I didn't really have a lot of belief that this was going to turn into one gigantic trending day is twofold. One, let's say you, you have a true gap of plus 30 or minus 30, let's say, right? And it's a true gap the way you and I define a gap. A market has a prior day low at 2,600 and then you open at 2,570. I think you'd have to agree that if the market gives you a signal of good tempo, high confidence, it's much easier for a market to drive through that void of price action, that window, that air pocket that doesn't exist and fill the gap, right? To go zero to 30 points when you have nothing in front of you, just clear sky of gap is different from opening inside of a prior day's range. And okay, now we're gonna drive through all this value. That's what happened, but I generally tend to not believe it when it's setting up that way because the market has a lot of, a, a lot, quote unquote, it has a lot to the left to crunch through, you know? And that's, that's the way I saw the, the early situation. And to me, early on, uh, you know, I saw that we went into value and then we started to pause. And, you know, it just felt like a lot of push pull. But, you know, overall, uh, by the end of the day, obviously, uh, you know, my, my doubting was proved wrong. We, we, we rallied a lot. But, but that was my take. I just want to say, Jim, is that, you know, the fact that we were moving through the prior day's range and not really in a real gap situation, I thought was tricky. Well, um, I did call it a real gap because we did open, at least on my charts, we opened below yesterday's range. Wasn't a big gap. But the... What I see happen so often, the time, the thing that misleads us is when the market has been so short overnight, mm -hmm. there's a tendency for uh, traders to, re to <laughs> reflect on the overnight price being lower, and they can't wait to sell into any little rally. <clears throat> and it's that selling into those rallies that can mislead you. And that's why it, it's so important. Let me get to... CQG back up here. When I was saying earlier, that's why it's so important to monitor one time framing. And and I was looking at it very closely this morning, although even as I said, you know, I excuse me, I'm sorry. You know, I did sell my calls. I was very proud of myself, which of course was a a very stupid sell, but it's where they mislead you is when they're selling into they're selling into those rallies, every little bounce. And they did it in the top of A period. They did it in B period. They did it in C period. So, you know, for part of better part of an hour, you know, we saw them selling every little bounce or every little rally. And that has a tendency to mislead you. But one of the things I monitor to see that we did not get four wide here. We stayed three wide. We stayed two wide. We stayed three wide. In fact, at one time I put out a chat comment and I said, if there's anything here, uh, we'll come down and get, uh, I believe that was the time, uh, four wide at 2595. Um, I may be thinking of another period, but that's the concept. But we didn't. We continued to, we continued on up and staying thin in one time frame. And we did that all the way up until we took out, we took out the high. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, those are the things that, you know, there, there's just sometimes trying to keep yourself on track is very difficult. And I agree with what you say when you are, when you are calling every signal in there, it's sometimes 
the trap is, you know, you're looking at valuary highs and lows and points of control and things like that. And sometimes you just got to say, this is a different day. The momentum is here. Um, some of that, that stuff doesn't matter today. That's the trap we all fall into. Yeah, okay. I agree. So, I agree. Anyhow, um, you got anything else to say about the intensive coming up? Um, I'm excited for those that are taking it. You know, I mean, obviously I, I, uh, you know, I always, uh, try to explain to people the value in it. Um, I think this thing that you're doing with the replay is really cool. I've seen a couple of those. Um, that's pretty cool guys, because understand that you can always fast forward it as fast as you want, but Jim's got, uh, people on his staff that are putting a lot of work into this. Uh, as I understand, it takes a few hours each day to put one together. And it's literally the entire day with his comments, but they're typed over. So it's meant to be silent. And you just hit the space bar and just advance through real quick. And, you know, it's cool. So yeah, there's that, six that, to eight that, that, hours. It, it sounds ridiculous, but it's six to eight hours uh, to put together a, one of these 20 minute synopsis. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really this is, you know, this is not a fly by night uh, type of thing. It's taken yeah. very seriously. Matter of fact, uh, Jen and RJ, who do this, when they first offered to do this, when we were starting up, um, they're my new partners. When we first they offered to do this, I said, are you sure? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do you understand how long this is going to take? And they said, well, no, that's we we understand. Well, as it turns out, when it got to be six to eight hours a day, finally, Jen says, could we have Wednesdays off <laughs> to recuperate? So now you get them for uh uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, they do take Wednesday off. But that's how much time goes into putting them together, six to eight hours, so that it gives you a chance uh, to watch the recap, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, you'll take longer than that to watch it because you'll stop, pause, and study some of the things. Um, okay, questions that are out there from uh, today's uh, presentation. Yeah, if anybody has any specific questions for Jim regarding – uh, anything in the presentation or, or market action, just type it there and, and we'll get to it. Um, let me see here. Somebody had something earlier that I thought, oh, this is something, Jim, that I know the answer to, but I think it'd be better if they if they heard it from you. Uh, somebody's asking is if the, you know, the material in session two is different from one or if there's a prerequisite. I always tell people that uh, they don't have to attend uh, course one in order to benefit from course two because it's not a it's you know it's not a follow on thing. It's kind of just that it's a completely different market. But if you could expound on that, I think that would be helpful. Certainly, um, it is. It is not uncommon to have people uh, attending their um, third or fourth intensive. Um, I have one individual who was the you know the largest. Um, person involved in the hedge fund area for one of the big firms. And, uh, you know, he said when he took the uh, first one, <coughs> he uh, thought this would come easy to him. And he realized that he really uh, didn't absorb that much. He said when he took the second one, he was amazed at what was starting to tick, to stick. And he said, now everyone he takes, he said, it just gets, it just, he understands more and more. What happens is that no two intensives are the same. And the reason for that is that every single day is different in the marketplace. It is very, you know, if every day was the same, well, then you'd, you'd get it down pretty quickly. But experience, experience is, are, is gained by seeing things explained over many different types of days. And of course, as you understand now, uh, the volatility, and let me just put a, a fast chart of the VIX up. Um, and you see that, uh, you know, this was the VIX back, and I believe that's 15. Then what happens, volatility gets high like this, and then it has a tendency to take quite a bit of time. This is a uh, a weekly chart, and you can see it just gradually goes down. And then we move sideways with very low, getting down in the 10 range for a period of time. And then, again, we get this big spike up in volatility. And more than likely, that will go on just as it did here for some period of time. 
trading in that, what you learn with these kind of markets, totally different than what you learn in these kind of markets. Uh, because it's just, it's they're almost like different markets. One of the things I hear a lot of times people teach uh, traders to tell them that road to success is figure out, figure out what they do well and then concentrate on that. And I happen to think that's not the correct answer because if you really want to be a serious trader and do it as, you know, as a, as a livelihood, you have to adapt to every market. The market doesn't adapt to you. You have to adapt to every market. Biggest mistakes traders make a lot of times. They try and tr the type of trading they did in this kind of market, they try to apply when the volatility goes up. That's really bad. That's, you know, it's a totally different environment. So what you really, you, you could go to every single day is different, but session one to session two, uh, you know, we concentrate on the same topics, you know, in the broad outline. But we start with each day, you know, we're live for an hour and a half to two hours each day. Then the chat comments throughout the day and the reports every day. So you're seeing something different almost every day in the market. And that's where experience comes from. Thank you for the question. Yeah, that's great, Jim. That's great. Um, just going through here. Jim, by any chance on your window trader, do you have, um, you may have like closed and reopened. Somebody was asking why you have uh, double the number of contracts at the bottom. I was just curious, like maybe, maybe it just, it, I mean, whenever that happens, it just requires a refresh because they were asking if that was a nuance, but that's not a nuance. Like go, go down to the bottom of your profile and see your contracts. Well, I have it, I have it split out. The, oh, okay. The, the profile on the left is a non-split out profile. The profile on the right is split out so that I can, this allows me to see nuances. This makes it a lot easier for me to see when one time framing stops. When, and on a day like this, today it was pretty thin. It's not very difficult. When you get a day like um, we had two days ago, uh, it is very difficult, maybe it was yesterday, very difficult to see the differences in there. So I run I run both. Incidentally, let's take a look at split out yesterday for a second. The talk about the intensives. Yesterday was such an interesting day that we are going to, uh, for those that are clients in the intensive, uh, it was such an interesting day, so educational, that we're offering a um, a free, another additional webinar for two hours on Saturday morning. Of course, they're always um, they're always recorded, but it's uh, it was just such an unbelievable day for trading that we thought it was worth adding that as an you know as an extra uh, supplement. For example, one of the things I don't know how many people have heard me use the term firecracker effect. Firecracker effect happens when you have, and this can happen on a daily bar chart. You know, I see it on daily bar charts all the time where you'll have, you know, daily bar uh, lows that are close together. And all of a sudden one day will come out and take out four or five days in one time. Same effect happens on the uh, daily profile with the F, G, H, and J periods were close together. Now, when I say I'm doing the chat comment throughout the day, I pointed out the potential, not that it was going to happen, but I pointed out the potential for the firecracker effect. Um, I don't know, it was a half an hour, 40 minutes before it happened. What the firecracker effect does is taking out one low, and in this case, you'd have sell stops, taking out the lows for one period, triggers taking out the lows for the next period, figures taking out the lows for the following period. And that's exactly what happened in K period. You got what we call the firecracker effect. That firecracker effect worked both ways yesterday because when it goes, when it went back up, you had HIJ 
highs relatively close together, the market came back up and you got the firecracker effect on both sides. So again, there, there are markets learning to trade markets. It's not as simple as here's the value area high and low, you know, and the point of control and the migrating point of control. If you really get to compete on a very professional level, understanding nuances are what make the difference. Remember, anybody that's going to trade and be successful and profitable, there are no practice courts. The minute you do a live trade, you are have to compete against the best in the world. And unfortunately, you can't start anyplace else. So that's why when we're, when we're teaching, we're pointing out the importance of nuances because that's really what makes the difference if you're going to be able to compete. Other questions, comments? Jim, you are, uh, you know, we get this, we get this a lot, but it's always uh, different people in each webinar, but just to um, refresh, and, and you are very uh, set on just looking at things in 30 minutes, I understand, right? You, you generally just use the profile charts and you keep it on the 30 minutes. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Do you feel that the smaller time frames are too noisy for you? I'm like anybody else. When I was first introduced to the uh, to the market profile, I tried 15 minutes, five minutes, everything else. And I found through experience the same thing that Stoudemire, who developed the profile, had found. But I found it on my own. And I found that, you know, the more significant changes took place on the half hour. And if you watch, you know, when markets roll over to the half hour period, you will see far more activity at the change over the 30 minute period than you see any other period. And a lot of times, if you're using 15 minute bars or something less, you don't notice things like one time frame. You, you know, the 15 minute bars will take it out where the 30 minute bars don't. So I guess the answer to your question would be, yeah, I think it, it uh, you get too much noise in that, in those smaller areas. And the other thing that I suggest to people is, you know, and I go through this all the time, we all have too many studies and charts and lines on our on our computers. I tell the story when I took an, over an institutional desk at uh, Payne Weber that became UBS years ago. The first thing I did in the first month there was take off ten thousand dollars a month in studies, and that was a lot of money back then. And of course, every institutional trader on the desk. They were going to leave. My comment was, if you're going to leave, leave. Don't threaten me. And uh, I don't think anybody left. And over the years, uh, I saw several of those same names in the Wall Street Journal. And their trading got better. Uh, so a lot of times, traders think that more is better. And I have found that less is better. You know, keep it, keep it simple. I mean, not 100% people, but keep it simple so that you have a better, broader perspective of what is going on. Other questions? Jim, the, uh, the profile was very elongated today and very stretched out, split into many distributions, and there are a lot of single prints uh, in between. Uh, and I totally understand the import of that. Um, on the other hand, however, Volume POC did migrate higher all the way up to the top. Do you put any weight on that? I don't follow the, the volume uh, POC. And the reason I don't is that um, the volume POC does not incorporate price. And price is so important to me. Uh, I mean, so it doesn't incorporate time. Price advertises opportunity. Time regulates um you know, those opportunities, volume measures the success or failure. And on a day like today, when the market is, you know, one time framing higher, I would clearly expect that you would see uh, the volume POC rise. But I don't, when, when the market's one time framing higher like this, I really don't look at much else. I just say, don't fight one time framing, go with it uh, for the day. So, no, I don't look at it. But, again, as I've said to people over the years, um, you know, this isn't – in fact, it was my, my previous partner that said, you know, this isn't worth 
going to war about. Um, a lot of people follow follow both. I just happen to prefer the conventional TPO um, POC because it does incorporate time. And given today's action, then that you don't pay attention to the volume puck, would you s still say that then it would follow that the rally is um, maybe not so firm footing because the bulk of the value is really you know where the T TPOs were you know four five six across were from twenty six sixteen to twenty six oh three and after that nothing it's just skinny 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 all the way up. Yeah, I usually when I see a market stretched out like this, it's very similar to what I said about the market going down overnight. It is usually emotional. It's a combination of short covering and emotional buying. Mm -hmm. Traders just afraid they're going to miss out on something. And yep. when that happens, very often within the next day or two, you will see a substantial portion of a day like today taken back. Light volume, very stretched out, and more than likely just very emotional buying. Uh, greed, 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 momentum. I, I can't afford to miss this. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, um, Jim, I think that's going to do it. Peter, thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. We really appreciate having you. It's always uh, highly informative. Uh, and uh, like we've been saying, I highly recommend uh, checking out Jim's Intensive. That's kicking off on April 18th, and he is issuing a lot of uh, reports during the days uh, leading up to it uh, as a bonus, which is uh, really good. So I've always said that if you enjoy my writing in the morning, uh, Jim's stuff is like me on steroids. So uh, definitely check that out. All right. Thank you again, Jim. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Take care.